President Wallace, Chief Justice Parker, Judge Duncan, distinguished guests and friends of Campbell Law. One of my aunts often recounted a story of which I have no recollection. She said that one hot, dewy August morning when I was 11 or 12, after several back-breaking hours in the tobacco field, I stood up at the end of a row and exclaimed, this is for the birds. I'm going to law school. <laughs> it seemed improbable. My father was the only one of 10 boys in his family to finish high school, and no one before me had attempted college. From that tobacco field to where I stand today would seem a pretty far climb. But in some ways, I'm here because of that tobacco field and the values learned there that have shaped my entire life. And they were simple. Each person did his or her assigned job without complaint. Whether you bunched and handed leaves, strung them onto tobacco sticks, took sleds to and from the field, primed your road, or, and these were the trial lawyers of the tobacco field, you got to climb the rafters and barn the crop. Laziness and shoddiness were not tolerated. But if help was genuinely needed, it was freely provided. And it was done with a spirit of good humor. And thanks to God that we were able to work together as a family and to prosper from our joint efforts. And these are not just my personal values, but the values to which I have held the institutions that I have led and the values that I bring you today. Still, this is a career that almost did not happen. I will always be grateful to the Dean of the Yale Law School, who, when I stopped by the second week of class with my car packed to go home, persuaded me to at least gut out one semester. And when I did finish law school and returned to Raleigh to clerk for the legendary district judge here, Franklin Dupree, I'm grateful that he was a man who also believed in second chances. This is evidenced by the published opinion of the Fourth Circuit holding that the jury tampering by the thankfully anonymous law clerk was harmless error. <laughs> but today is not primarily about me, but about Campbell Law School. In the fall of 1976, 86 law students entered Old Kibbit Hall to become the founding class. They were taking some risk, choosing an unaccredited law school with no track record. The faculty was small, the experience intimate. Dr. Wiggins himself taught criminal law, always on Saturday morning. The school's graduates did well. It provided opportunities for legal studies to many students who would otherwise have had none, and shaped by its bedrock Christian values, for 30 years, it sent lawyers who, thought, who were thoughtful, compassionate, and well-skilled into the North Carolina legal community and beyond. Under three fine deans, Larry Davis, Pat Hedrick, and Willis Wichard, it prospered. For purposes of today, let's call that Campbell Law 1.0. 30 years later, things have changed. Legal education had become more competitive. It seemed clear that the market would not for long ignore the lure of a thriving Raleigh. If Campbell did not relocate here, someone else would. And besides, the law school was literally falling down as the sandstone bricks molded by the Kibbett family began to dissolve. And so, on the recommendation of a thoughtful task force, the difficult decision to move the law school was made. In retrospect, the decision to move was not as hard as its implementation. The rapid transformation of a nondescript, poorly designed, and badly functioning office building into the palace of learning that we now enjoy was nothing short of miraculous. With the move to Raleigh, enrollment swelled, standards rose, and the city embraced our school as its own. And we owe this to the brilliant vision and tenacity of my predecessor as Dean, Melissa Essery, and her loyal Sancho Ponza, Vice Dean and Interim Dean and now Dean of the Business School, Keith Faulkner. 
And for today's purposes, let me refer to that period as Campbell Law 2.0. Campbell Law 1.0 and Campbell Law 2.0 enrich us and they provide the foundation on which we proceed. But they are our history, not our future. Today, let me talk with you about the major forces that will shape Campbell Law 3.0 and how we should proceed. I do this with some trepidation. One of the things we tell new judges is to avoid publishing anything in your first year on the bench, because by your fifth, it will embarrass you. <laughs> I fear the same may be true of deans. And to those of you who were nervous that I have closeted myself and am now ready to spring Campbell Law 3.0 on you, nothing could be further from the truth. Our faculty should take comfort in the fact that I live with a tenured professor and your prerogatives with regard to curriculum and programs are explained to me regularly. <laughs> and the law school has a strategic plan unanimously adopted by the faculty last year. And it is incisive and thoughtful, and nothing I say here this afternoon is in any way inconsistent with it. But like most strategic plans, it covers a wide waterfront. My job as dean is to figure out from which peers we leave first. To that task, I bring from my experience the ability to listen long and patiently, to question closely, and then to decide and move forward. Let us focus for a minute on our strengths. If you had read as many faculty evaluations as I have recently, you would know that we have a remarkable group of outstanding teachers. They are engaged, creative, demanding, and responsive. You would be hard pressed to match the quality inside our classrooms. We are supported by a tireless and talented staff, totally committed to our joint enterprise. We have one of the most architecturally distinctive and seamlessly functioning law buildings in the country. From our dramatic entrance, to our warm and inviting library, to our well-designed and naturally lit classrooms that are on the cutting edge technologically, it is a wonderful place to work and study. Under the visionary leadership of Dr. Wallace, we are part of a vibrant, supportive, and expanding greater university. If you have read the newspapers in the past few weeks, Campbell University has dominated the headlines, all with positive news. The synergy between the main campus and the law school is real. For many of you who came here like me, many years ago when Raleigh was just a sleepy little southern town that no one had ever much noticed, you also probably awake each morning amazed that we now live in one of the most cosmopolitan vibrant, fast-growing, and technologically hip cities in America. It is a wonderful place to live and to work, and it is a wonderful place to train lawyers. Many parts of Campbell Law 3.0 will not change and will be familiar to many of you. We have one of the most demanding required curricula of any law school in the country, and I will not advocate backing off that. Not only does it stand our students in good stead when it comes to licensing, which is not unimportant, after all, that is why most people go to law school, but it also ensures that our graduates, even if they're not expert in an area, can recognize problems and issues across a broad swath of substantive law and steer their clients accordingly. We have an extensive advocacy program required for all students. The ability to advocate is not important only in courtrooms. Wherever our students go, the confidence to stand on your own feet, respond to hard questions, and craft a reasoned response will always be an asset. In this texting and tweeting generation, formal writing has never been more critical. Our legal writing and research program is first rate. If we make changes, it will only be to expand opportunities to write substantively and analytically. Our programs that reach into this city are strong. Our juvenile justice and senior law clinics provide needed services to those populations. 
Over 100 of our rising second and third year students have just finished externships this summer, and we are about to take the wraps off a sophisticated mentoring program involving our students and the local bar that will go into place next spring. And our fundamental Christian values that direct us to see law as a calling and inform the way we treat each other and all of our fellow citizens will remain at our very core. Our strong group of perspectives courses that require our students to think broadly about the place of law in moral society will stay with us. With all of that said, these are shifting times in legal education, and we are not immune. The pool of prospective students is declining, as many wonder whether the financial outlay and uncertain job prospects are worth the effort. The legal profession and the organized bar have grown increasingly impatient with what they see as a disconnect between what is taught in law school and the skills needed to practice law. The regulatory structure is cracking. Already, New York and soon New Jersey will not allow a student to sit for the bar without having performed at least 50 hours of pro bono service in law school. The state of California is poised to deny admission to its bar to any student who did not receive 15 hours of professional skills training in law school. These trends are not going away they are likely to accelerate. So, how does Campbell Law respond? First, it is time for a top to bottom examination of our curriculum. I hasten to add this should come as no surprise. It is both in our strategic plan and in the last report of the curriculum committee. We need to very quickly identify the areas of expertise in which the next generation of lawyers will be needed and effective and candidly evaluate our ability to respond to those trends. Whether we call them tracks or pathways or concentrations, the nomenclature is unimportant. What is important is that we provide coherent and nuanced packages of substantive courses, planning and skills courses, targeted externships, subject-specific clinics, and relevant pro bono opportunities to make our students as profession-ready in their chosen area as any school in the country. And consistent with the second great commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves, we will look for pedagogically sound models to teach our students that also provide real and needed services to the least fortunate among us in our community. I will be asking many in this audience to provide us with your time, your talent, and your treasure as we figure out these new initiatives and attempt to make them operational. And there is one other fundamental way in which Campbell Law 3.0 must look different. Although we do have some fine dual degree programs, we are primarily a one-trick pony. We offer one product, a three-year Juris Doctor degree. That is a dangerous model today. Any number of ideas of other possible programs and initiatives have been floating around for some time. It is time to move. I intend to empower an initiatives committee and to ask them by December to identify for me two or three new areas that we should pursue, whether it be an evening program, a part-time day program, various LLM programs, masters in law programs, paralegal training, more joint programs with other schools, additional CLE opportunities or an international venture. I cannot tell you all of the answers, only that we will be stronger if we broaden our economic base. To our students here, this is a noble but demanding occupation you have chosen to enter. When I went to see a new dentist a couple of decades ago, he took one look in my mouth and said, you must be a lawyer. <laughs> Impressed by his forensic ability, I asked how he knew. He replied, you don't have any back molars. You ground them down. It's true of every lawyer I see. <laughs> we carry in our hands people's lives. Who will get custody of children? Whether the family business will survive, whether dad will go to jail, or whether the mega million dollar merger will actually come off. To meet these challenges, we owe you three things. An academic education, 
that is substantively strong across subjects. The set of skills that allows you to enter our profession ready to contribute. And a culture true to our Christian heritage that instills in each of you values of integrity, trustworthiness, and commitment to justice. The privilege to sit every day under the American flag in a federal courtroom and resolve disputes among fellow citizens is the highest honor our democracy can bestow. No one ever loved it or revered it more than I did. I've often said I would rather try a good case than go on vacation. In many years, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> and there are some regrets at leaving it. My jokes are no longer very funny. <laughs> and it seems that lawyers return the phone calls of judges much faster than they do those of deans. <laughs> and the regrets are not only mine. A few weeks ago, I was bringing my children downtown to the fireworks, and it was a mob scene. As we approached the blockade at Martin Street, the police officer, at my request, moved the blockade and let me right into the federal court judge's parking lot, right in the middle of the action. From the back seat, my very prescient eight-year-old, Louise Gray, piped up. So we're not going to be able to do this any longer? <laughs> I assured her and her siblings that this job comes with advantages too, and they're already scouting out our best locations to bring their friends to watch the Christmas parade. I have walked away from that life to stand before you today after considerable thought, reflection, discussion, and prayer. My decision is a testament to my faith in the future of this institution. I believe that with the blessing of divine providence and our collective hard work and goodwill, our brightest days are in front of us. I look forward to your support in our quest. Thank you for being here.